All right, I want to welcome you all to reInvent 2019 and thanks for choosing this session. If you are here to learn about Dropbox's hybrid cloud story, you are in the right room. I'm Anuj Devangan and I'm a senior solutions architect with AWS. It's also my pleasure of welcoming Andrew Fong from Dropbox who would be talking to us about the Dropbox hybrid cloud. So to start with, uh, I have a little story. So the final reInvent presentations were due on October and I submitted this deck to the reInvent system. Of course, I needed to make a few changes after that and a few more. And by the time we were in December, I had a brand new presentation sitting on my laptop. So yesterday, I was at the speaker ready room trying to make updates to my presentation so that I have the latest deck here. And I had my worst nightmare come true. My laptop would not power on. Then it struck me that I could not have been that stupid. So I looked up my Dropbox folder and voila, there it was, the latest version of my presentation. I had this immense satisfaction at that moment, knowing that the Dropbox folder itself is powered by the Dropbox and AWS hybrid cloud. So as far as this presentation is concerned, I'm going to start uh, by addressing a few fundamental topics. Why do customers need a hybrid cloud? What are some of the customer needs around a hybrid cloud architecture? And how does AWS help? Then Andrew would be presenting the Dropbox hybrid cloud story to us. All right, so why do customers need a hybrid cloud? Uh, there are some applications that need to run on premises, and there are three major reasons for that. Firstly, we have some enterprises who are running legacy or custom-built applications, which rely on proprietary on-premises technologies. So these applications, they need to continue running on premises. Secondly, we have a set of applications that need low latency access to certain customer endpoints. An example here is high frequency trading and exchange platforms, where even a millisecond could be the difference between a profit or a loss. And thirdly, we have applications that need to process data locally. There are some examples here, mostly in the media and entertainment sector, where customers are generating a vast amount of data which could be raw media content, and they want to process it locally before they move it to AWS for further processing. So with, with that, uh, these customers who are running applications on premises, they treat AWS often as a logical extension of their data centers. Uh, and all of these use cases, they fall under the umbrella of data center extension. So first up, we have cloud bursting. With cloud bursting, customers use AWS for additional capacity when they run out of capacity in their own data centers. This could include things like compute and storage. Secondly, we have disaster recovery. With disaster recovery, customers store their data backups in AWS, and we often have customers who also deploy applications across their data centers and AWS. Thirdly, we have distributed data processing. Now, this is a use case where customers actually ship their data from their data centers to AWS for further processing. This includes things like data analytics and machine learning inferences. And finally, customers often leverage the global infrastructure that AWS provides, which is 22 regions and growing, to deploy their applications and make it available to a global audience. Uh, the second set of uh, use cases that we have seen for customers who have a hybrid cloud is application migration. So at AWS, we have several customers who are migrating hundreds or even thousands of applications to the cloud. And this process itself could take multiple years. So in these cases, customers still need an environment where they could consistently operate their applications. And that's why they need a hybrid cloud. And finally, uh, we have the third use case, and this is quite unique to AWS. We have customers who were born in the cloud, and they continue to grow in the cloud, as well as customers who have completely migrated to the cloud. So these customers, they have standardized on the AWS API. Now, if these customers have newer use cases where they need to deploy applications on premises, maybe it's because of uh, low latency or local data processing needs, then these customers want to continue using the same AWS APIs that they use today. 
We call this use case as cloud services on premises because effectively the customer is trying to do the same operations that they do with AWS and extend that model to their on premises data centers. An example here is with industrial automation, and we see this a lot. Uh, customers have deployed their technology infrastructure on AWS, they have standardized on AWS APIs, and now they want to run applications on premises and they want to use the same APIs, so they actually want to have an infrastructure that uses the same APIs that they use with AWS. So uh, customers who actually set out to build a hybrid cloud, what they often expect is that they get a simple and straightforward path that gets them to their hybrid cloud vision, right? So they want common APIs, they want uh, a consistent way of operating and managing the hybrid cloud. But what they really get is the following quite a few bumps in the road. And these include things like networking and host management, the need for unified monitoring and logging across the hybrid infrastructure, the need for unified security, including unified identity and access management, and finally, the biggest one of them all, the need for a common set of APIs for operating as well as service provisioning across the cloud. So I want to do a quick poll here trying to understand how many of you are operating a hybrid cloud today? Okay, about 40% of the room. And how many of you have ever encountered any of the issues shown here? Almost the same. So this is quite common, right? These are some of the biggest problems that we see with customers. I want to stress this point. Uh, building a hybrid cloud is hard, right? Uh, whoever we talk to, they have never had an easy way to build a hybrid cloud. Uh, so our customers have been telling us that they need operational consistency, which means that they need a common set of APIs for operating and managing the cloud. They need these APIs to be simple and secure, similar to the ones that they have on AWS today. Customers need the capability to build once and deploy anywhere. What this really means is that customers need a consistent platform to deploy their code across on-premises and AWS, and they also want the performance to be similar. They need the same enterprise-level SLAs that they get with AWS today. And finally, they want to do all of this, leveraging the existing skill sets and tools that are available to them in their organization. So at AWS, we love listening to customer feedback and building new services. So to start with, what we have done here is we have built a framework which provides a mental model as well as, as, well as identifies some of the building blocks of a hybrid cloud. So at the bottom of this framework is the infrastructure layer. So we have a network backbone which connects customer infrastructure to AWS. And these three components together, the customer data centers, AWS, and the network backbone together form the infrastructure layer for the hybrid cloud. Built on top of the infrastructure layer, we have certain core services. And when I say core services, these are the services that every hybrid cloud needs to implement. These include fleet management, which includes things like host management for servers, networking devices, and storage devices that you may have in your data centers. There is a need for unified logging and monitoring across the hybrid cloud. There's also the need for unified security, including unified identity and access management, as well as unified security practices across the hybrid cloud. Now, built on top of the core services are the services that you are really used to seeing. These are the hybrid cloud services. These include things like compute, storage, networking, databases, as well as higher level services like analytics and machine learning. Essentially, these are the services that provide a common set of APIs for you to, to provision these services, as well as to operate and manage the hybrid cloud. Now, AWS provides quite a few services to build each of these building blocks. So we have services across content and network delivery. We have device management. We have security. We have monitoring and logging. We also have higher level services in compute storage, as well as migration and transfer. Now, not all customers want to really build their own cloud. 
So we have customers who have told us that it's so difficult that we would love AWS to come with a solution for all of these problems. So AWS has created some vertically integrated hybrid cloud solutions, starting with AWS Outposts. AWS Outposts provides the same infrastructure. So it's essentially the same hardware that we run in our data centers. We offer that to our customers to run, run it in their data centers. It provides the same APIs that we use, and that you are used to with AWS. It's the same operations and management model, including the monitoring tools, CloudWatch, everything that you are used to. And it also allows you to leverage your existing skills. Because if you are used to AWS APIs, you do not need to adapt to a second set of APIs. Outpost comes in two versions. The first version is API compatible with AWS. And the second version is API compatible with VMware Cloud on AWS. We also have formed a partnership with VMware to build VMware Cloud on AWS. This essentially allows customers to deploy VMware's SDDC technologies on AWS, which allows customers to use, again, the same set of APIs, but these are VMware APIs to, to operate the hybrid cloud. Uh, with that, uh, let me hand it over to Andrew to talk about uh, Dropbox's hybrid cloud. Thanks, Anders. So as Anuj said, my name is Andrew Fong. I head infrastructure at Dropbox. And this infrastructure for us means everything from the physical layers, the network, the data centers, um, the supply chain organizations, capacity management, storage services. So it runs the gambit, um, CI, CD. All of that is what we consider to be within the remit of infrastructure. And we think of infrastructure at Dropbox of having the purpose of maximizing product development in a sustainable fashion. And so with that, that's the framing I would use to think about how we thought about building this hybrid cloud, because it really is about providing, pro providing a platform which allows product, to be, product development to be maximized. Well, let's take a step back before we talk about the infrastructure and just talk a little bit about Dropbox. How many people in the room use Dropbox or have so a decent number of people in the room, almost more than 40% use, use Dropbox, that's good. Um, so how many of you, most of you probably are familiar with our traditional file sync and share product, where you put a file into a folder, it syncs back to the, to the cloud, and you get it on another, another device. Is that the use case most people here typically use? use? See a lot of heads nodding. Where we're moving as a company and as a product is actually to build the world's first smart workspace. And what this means is we really want to help people and teams stay organized and stay focused on the work that they do every day. How many people here have more than five browser tabs open on any given day? I'm guessing that's 100% of the room. Um, how many people have a different application in every one of those tabs? Probably the same number of people are gonna raise their hand. Um, so a lot of what we're doing is saying, okay, we have, this, we have this content. We have a lot of the world's content. And we know that this content is used to make workflows on top of. We know that people collaborate on this content. And so we want to build a surface and a product which allows people to collaborate on top of that content because at the end of the day, the content is what's, what's important to you all. And so that's, that's the product vision, that's where we're going, and so that's what this cloud is supporting, that's what this, this hybrid interface that, between AWS and Dropbox is supporting. So why hybrid? And I should preface this, um, if you've seen other Dropbox talks, Dropbox was a hybrid cloud from day one. We had always had a partnership with AWS since the very initial launch of, uh, of Dropbox. We have used them for many different use cases over the years. And so on day one, we were, a hybrid, we were hybrid. So we had to tackle a lot of the problems that Nuj just talked about very early on. And we've been able to mature a lot of those processes. And hopefully what I tell you today is a story around how we've made that, how we've leveraged additional products inside of Amazon, so of AWS, to partner more closely with our infrastructure so we can continue this partnership and continue to expand, expand the hybrid footprint. So why hybrid for us, though? At a high level scale, innovation, and agility. And I'm gonna go into each of these, but on the surface, our scale is large, we wanna innovate quickly, and we wanna move pretty, pretty quickly. Um, and we wanna have the flexibility to move around um, and be agile, right? If you're building a product and you wanna maximize product development in a sustainable way, you really need to be agile as well. So let's take a look at scale. This is, to level set, this is what we power. 
this infrastructure is powering over three exabytes of storage. And this is storage, this storage is actually mostly on-premise for Dropbox, but we actually have to move this content to Anuja's point into the public cloud, into AWS, to actually do data processing and provide additional value on top of it as we provide the world's first smart workspace. We also have to have global expansion. 600 million users use the product. These 600 million users are not located in San Francisco where our headquarters are. They're located globally. And so we need to actually provide a footprint that's international, not just based in the US, not just based in Europe. And AWS actually helps us do a lot of that. So we'll get into that and talk through how we think about global expansion and how we leverage AWS for that. And the last is economies of scale. And this goes to, because we have this much data and this much content, we're actually able to take advantages, and we'll get into this a little bit, around how we've been able to find ways to leverage this in the supply chain world and do some innovation on the hardware platforms as well. So we really think about this as an end-to-end -end solution. We think about this all the way from hardware to the software stack that we're using inside of Amazon. Next is innovation. So scale, and the next portion that we care about is innovation. And like I was saying, this innovation doesn't just start in the software layer. This innovation starts with hardware. And we move all the way up the stack. This is truly hybrid. And from a hardware perspective, we partner very closely with our supply base. And for those that know that three exabytes of storage, yes, at one point, a lot of that was stored in S3. And what we did is we built a very purpose-built storage system that was fully vertically integrated. And this is a big part of the hybrid story for us is that we were able to leverage that scale and create a very specific niche product for ourselves. And what we've done there is we've partnered a lot with the supply base and we've first to market in things like SMR. So if you know anything about drive technology, hard drive technology over 14 terabytes, most likely is going to move to an entirely new technology called SMR within the next two to three years. We're the first to deploy that at exabyte scale in the world. Second was, and I was super thrilled to see a lot of the announcements around AMD with AWS, we were actually the first large-scale deployment of AMD in the world um, in the cloud. And so these are where we start on the hardware. And then we move up to the software side, where we have to make sure that when we think about having all this storage, we actually have to provide value to the users for the smart, smart workspace. Well, our core competencies are going to be around storage. Amazon has a lot of other core competencies, such as ML, AI, the ability to do great analytics. So we use them and focus on the software stack in that part of, uh, part of the ecosystem to focus really on how do we innovate on that, on that aspect. And we'll talk through some use cases of where Amazon has provided a lot of value on innovation on the software side. And the third is around agility. So time to market is very important. I, how many people, this is a common problem you talk about probably, is how fast do we get this to our customers, right? We want to find product market fit very quickly. We need to get product launched. We need to expand internationally. And if you've ever tried to build a data center, data center lead times, I, some of the data center folks from Dropbox are sitting here, a like minimum of six months to do this type of expansion. And so this is a place where we really can be agile by leveraging AWS's cloud in, area, in other regions. And we'll talk through some really big use cases we've had from that from a, from a compliance perspective as well, well as data locality. And then flexibility. One of the really important things for us is the ability to partner between Dropbox engineering and AWS engineering. And so when we looked at our analytics stack, as an example we're gonna talk about in a couple slides, we actually treat the team as an extension of the engineering team. We really want to find a deep partnership there. We're able to leverage AWS just like we're leveraging an internal development team. And that provides us a lot of flexibility because to be frank, AWS is a much larger organization. They're gonna have many more resources to put at a problem. And so we're able to create that leverage and that flexibility without having to go hire a bunch of people to solve a problem which may not be our core competency. So there's a lot of flexibility in having this hybrid cloud model. We can focus on what we're good at. We move some of the problem space into AWS where AWS has a lot of core competencies and allows us to be a lot more agile. So let's talk about some of the hybrid workloads. And I want to, we're going to back up a couple slides here to, and go back to what Anuj had talked about. And this is the, the Dropbox software stack. There's a lot of boxes on here, but if you remember, he had drawn a very simple stack that started with core services. Started with network, and so we have a hybrid network. We leverage a lot of direct connect between us and AWS. We have a very, we have a very foundational layer of core services where what we've done at that layer is abstracted everything from the layers above. Our machine management and provisioning looks exactly the same in AWS as it does on-prem. 
And this was a tenant that we took, we did on day one. We said if you, a machine that needs to move to reinstall in our physical data centers is exactly like throwing a machine away, it's just a zero step cycle inside of AWS. And so we were able to create abstractions for engineering teams that looked exactly the same as what they were used to, as, or rather gave them a single abstraction that was the same as both public cloud and private cloud from our perspective. Similarly with monitoring. We have one monitoring system that monitors both our public cloud and our private cloud. We have AWS monitoring, that, sorry, we have our monitoring system which is monitoring services in AWS, also monitoring services inside of Dropbox. Single solution. At the same time, at that layer also exist things like the identity and access management, where there may be some, we may have to leverage IAM inside of AWS, and at the same time we leverage different services inside of Dropbox to provide the exact same abstraction. Now, what's really important here, and one of the things that we really find very vital for this layer, is we actually have a single RPC system that's the same across all of our stack. And that allows us to leverage identity monitoring machine management in a very seamless fashion, so you don't have a different interface when you're moving between different, between different cloud stacks. And on top of that, because we have a single RPC interface, we have a single set of monitoring tools, a single set of machine management tools, we're able to build compute, storage, and database services as a hybrid layer, which solves the problem that Anuj was talking about in terms of operational complexity. There is no operational complexity to the end user. They have the same interface. They run the same command. The same command spins up an EC2 instance or provisions them a new machine or a new, um, a new container. And then on top of that is the application services, as Anuj talked about. And this is everything from our metadata to our block data. There's a lot of different pieces here. This is the Dropbox business logic. And these may be split between some AWS services and some Dropbox services, where what you'll find is that our portfolio of data storage, for example, is not gonna be as large as, as Amazon's. There was a great slide yesterday where there was a lot of database technology put on the slide. It was a long slide of database technology. And that's a huge advantage for AWS and a huge advantage for us to take advantage of. So we'll talk through some of that and how we leverage that that, um, that in the audit log systems. And then we have new products, such as HelloSign, Dropbox Paper. These are products that either are fully evolved in the cloud and now are taking advantage of some of our stack on our side, or they're things where we're trying to find product market fit and we want to iterate very quickly with. And we want to ship and we want to get out to the end user and we want to allow teams to have a very small contained interface on. But they still leverage the machine management and the, and the services that spin things up. And that allows the teams to from an engineering perspective, move around and for us to create flexibility so this interface is consistent, allows engineers to move from team A to team B without having to relearn a whole new tool, tool chain. Helps for, for, so if there's any engineering leaders in the room, that helps with retention and it helps with people literally coming to work to do what they do best as opposed to worrying about, do I have to learn a new tool chain every day? Because to be frank, right, it's about maximizing product development. It's not about learning a new tool chain. So this is how we thought about our software stack. And now I'm gonna dive into some of the uh, hybrid cloud strategy. Really what this boils down to is inside of Dropbox data centers, we have low latency applications, similar to what we were talking about on the financial trading side, where database access times, we run, and this is important for a couple slides later, we run something like 12,000 MySQL servers. That number of servers um, is how our data is sharded from a metadata perspective and requires a lot of low latency between them. So similarly, on AWS side, we want to leverage some scale and agility and innovation where there may be some pieces that we just don't feel like are the thing that we want to build and focus on because what we're building is a world's first smart workspace. We're not building the world's best analytics system. And so there's places where we're going to say, okay, this workload makes a lot of sense to put into AWS and for us to maybe be system of record but to move that data into AWS for processing because there's capabilities there that we just don't have. So let's talk through some of these use cases. Dropbox, when you think about a smart, work, smart workspace, when you create content, you want that content to be available anywhere. When you write a Microsoft Office document, you want that document to be viewable on your phone, to be viewable on your Mac computer, to be view, viewable on your PC. How many of you, probably it's a little less prevalent now, but I, I know I experienced this when I, when I was in school. Like I definitely was like, okay, I created this document. It doesn't open on this other device. That happens a lot. It happens much more in the enterprise space and the fidelity matters there. People care about the thing that they created has the same font that on, their, on their phone as it did on their machine that, that they made that document on. Now, what we found over time is that when we tried to build this ourselves and we didn't leverage the Amazon technology stack, 
you know, and this is going to sound crazy, we took Linux with Wine with OpenOffice and generated via, I'm pretty sure, LPR some uh, PDFs. And then we served those PDFs. I see a lot of people like sort of shaking their heads like, yeah, the fidelity is not great, right? <laughs> so, and what we learned of, from user research is that, look, people care about that. And we actually have to have the fidelity much better. So how do you get high fidelity? Microsoft Office is the application that produces that fidelity. Now, I'm guessing most people in the room have not tried to run Microsoft Office at scale in a data center. Like, I'm guessing that's probably zero hands are going to go up right now. Um, that's a hard problem. It's a problem that not a lot of people have tried to solve. And that's a problem we actually had to tackle with this. And if remember, our core competency is not going to be around building this type of infrastructure. It's going to be around low latency serving applications and our storage stacks. And so we said, OK. AWS, how can you help us on this one? And what we found is that we started looking around and we said, OK, well, what we need is a machine that can run Windows, but we really don't want to run Windows in production because that's going to, there's some security implications. It's a hard machine management problem, and we've solved this for Linux. What can we do? And what we found is there is these new metal instances. These metal instances run without a hypervisor in the traditional way that EC2 does and allowed us to actually run Linux with Windows and containers inside of them and run Microsoft Office and cycle them very quickly. And now we're able to produce a very high fidelity PDF version of the document very quickly. And at steady state right now runs it's something like 14,000 virtual CPUs in steady state and has burst capacity that's much more. And this is a great example of how by moving some of the workload to AWS, we're actually able to take advantage of some of their capabilities in a hybrid environment where the source of record lived in our system, but we actually were doing data processing inside of AWS. So that's one example of data processing. We're going to go through a couple others now. Next up is audit logs. As we move into the enterprise space and more and more Dropbox customers are enterprise users, they care about the access of files. They care about who's done what within the system. We're talking about putting and deploying this to wall-to-wall -wall in corporations where there's a legal team that needs to have e-discovery, needs to do holds, all of those sort of things. They need to understand exactly what the data is being used for. Now, when you think about the number of connections we talked about, 5 billion shared connections, exabytes of data, that's a lot of transactions happening through the system that you need to log and you need to keep track of. We talked about how we run large-scale MySQL instances. It's an RDMS. It's not going to be the best storage system to store this type of data. But guess who has a lot of great storage systems that may be great at storing this type of data? AWS. And so what we did is we said, we can handle the low latency part. We'll take the log ingestion. We'll take the, uh, the events that, system, that the uh, users are notifying us with. And we'll start to put it that. We'll, we'll store it. We'll put it through our front ends. But what we'll do is we'll move it off into AWS. And what we did is we found a set of storage solutions there between Dynamo um, and S3 that actually gave us a much better system, a better KV store than what we were able to build on MySQL, because MySQL, from our perspective, was meant more for a low latency application than this archival type of data system. And we've actually scaled this now to about 100 terabytes of data, handles about 20,000 writes per second. Um, and this is an example of where we believe this also is, a distributed data, is distributed data processing, but probably can be leveraged for other things as well, because now we have a KV store that can be used for other systems besides just audit logging as well. So once again, back to helping product and give them new features, we now have a system which they can leverage for other sets of capabilities they may want to launch. This one, we're proud to say we actually went live with, I believe, yesterday um, or this morning. Um, we flipped the switch to have our analytics system moved and be powered by AWS. So this is a great story about how we, we moved to a hybrid model on this. Analytics at Dropbox, I've been there for roughly I think, seven and a half years now, and we've, tra we've been challenged with the analytics problem over the years. Uh, the way I think about it is that we really were invested in making sure storage, making sure that our database technology, all of that worked really well. What we didn't focus on and we didn't have a great story around was what do our analytic systems look like? And what happened is, is you have product managers, business analysts, people come to work every day and they sit in front of their computer and they start typing and then they start typing harder and they start typing harder, right, because the query is not getting executed fast enough and they're getting more and more frustrated. 
And this was happening on a pretty regular basis. We were just not seeing and getting a lot of traction on the analytics system in, in a way that was going to allow us to set a foundation for product to actually make very important company decisions around how we were gonna build and use the product. And so we started talking to AWS about what could they do and what, how could they help us on this. And what we found is that there's a very powerful suite of technology there that can provide an end-to-end -end solution for us for our analytics problems. And so we've been over the last 18 to 24 months working on a journey with them where we can move to a centralized data lake model, where we can move all the data processing for analytics into the public cloud, onto AWS. And this is no small feat for us. And we went through all of the same problems that Nuj talked about in terms of operational complexity. Because this stack, as many of you know if you've run Hadoop, is not a simple stack to just up and move. And we had to adopt the AWS paradigms. And so this, I was sitting in the keynote yesterday, and I really liked what Andy was saying about how he had these four rules around how you have to do these type of migrations. Every single one of those rules, and if you didn't see the keynote yesterday, I really recommend watching it, it touched on all of these. A top-down mandate, making sure the teams were educated, um, making sure that you had a clear exit criteria and goals. All of these things were very important to making sure this migration worked. And at this point, we've moved 22 petabytes of data over into AWS to execute over 100,000 jobs daily on this. Um, and this pipeline takes data from Dropbox production services and moves it actually into the public cloud, into AWS, so that we can actually run these jobs on it. So another great example of how we've actually built a distributed data processing pipeline, where some of the data, it's ingested on our side and then moved over into the public cloud on AWS. We're super happy with this, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what we can do with, with this in the next couple months. And the last one around distributed data processing we'll talk about, and this one is like very important for us. This is actually, for us, one of the most critical product developments that we're gonna make in the next few years. Because when we say smart workspace, right, the word smart isn't there, so we must have some ML and AI into the, into the platform. Um, and so when we think about the use cases we wanna have, we really wanna make it so that if I'm looking at my menu bar, the menu bar shows exactly the right set of documents I need for the meeting that I'm gonna go into. When I get on the plane, exactly the right files are synced into my Dropbox folder. All of these things are very important use cases for, for our users. Now, that data, that three exabytes, though, that's a lot of that is stored on-prem in, in our facilities. And we actually have to find a way to build a platform which can allow us to process all of that data, allow us to find the insights, find the recognition um, that we need to have on images. All of that has to be handled. And so we're actually testing a lot of this infrastructure inside of AWS right now and trying to, and trying to build pipelines where we can actually do image recognition, text extraction, all of this on the AWS platform. Because we know as a core competency Similar to analytics, AWS is going to have a much, much wider breadth of experience. They have a much wider set of customers that they, can draw that they can draw on those experiences from. And we believe that if they set the foundation for us, we can spend the time on ML and AI in the area that is going to be most valuable for Dropbox, not by building a, a basic platform from, for ML and AI that is going to be, at best, on par with, with AWS, and at worst, not as sophisticated. And so we really want to say, and we really want to use this as a distributed processing model as well for ML and AI. So I'm looking forward actually to see a lot of these features show up inside of our product. And the last part I think Anoush touched on when we, when we talked about data processing is this concept of cloud bursting and disaster recovery. There's three major, uh, three major areas around this, and I'm going to go a little out of order here. We'll talk about disaster recovery first, since that's probably the simplest one. 12,000 databases, you have to back them up. Now, that's a lot of data, right? These are multi-terabyte databases, so we have to actually store that somewhere, and we want to make sure that's off-site. So we actually use S3 for this, and we actually archive and move all of this into S3, and I built pipelines that can restore all of that data on a regular basis, on a consistent basis, and validate that every single one of these backups works as well, back on-prem on the physical instances that they have to be restored onto. So that's a, it's a super important use case for us. Also, cloud bursting is very important for us. As much as I'd like to believe that we'll never have a supply chain shortage of hard drives, that we'll always have capacity available, there's a world in which there's floods in Thailand, there's no hard drives available, and so we need to provide this burst capability for our storage systems. We need to have a, an out when we need to actually store data somewhere else, and this is actually very interesting because it lets us also do some interesting things in global expansion, but 
we use this for cloud bursting. We actually have the ability in our storage systems to store data again in S3 if we need to, um, as a, in parallel to our own existing serving systems. These are the main use cases on the cloud bursting side for us. Um, there's some others around CI and CD, which are mostly fully baked in the cloud. These handle, we use a lot of the elastic natures of those systems where those are handling anywhere between, I think, tens of thousands of builds a day um, of our server code base and our desktop code bases are all handled in the public, in AWS's cloud for that. Um, so that's more of a, less of a bursting, but we do use a lot of elasticity there. The next example, and this is an example around the agility that we talked about earlier, our paper product. Our paper product was fully born in the cloud. This is really important for us. When we, and paper was an acquisition, and so the story of this acquisition is, it was built in the public cloud, built in AWS, it was there. And we said, okay, now you're a Dropbox, now you're a Dropbox company, now you're a Dropbox product. First question that everyone always asks is like, should we move the infrastructure? And the answer is always no, right? Like, unless, unless there's a really, really good compelling reason. Um, and I've been through a couple acquisitions and worked in a couple integrations, it's always the last thing you do. And we actually said, no, you need to stay on AWS. And we actually, as the infrastructure organization, pushed back very heavily from, from them moving into our private cloud. And the reason was, is because of the agility that they get from the, service fee, from the services that AWS offers, from the suite of, from the suite of data storage systems, from the suite of ML and AI, from the suite of monitoring, all of that for this product, as they're trying to find product market fit, is so much more important than them trying to do an in infrastructure integration with us. And so what we've done is taken an approach of, okay, let's leverage the bare necessities, right? We wanna make sure we can get some of the economies of scale that we have, so machine management makes a lot of sense. If they have to spin up new machines or if they have to re-image machines, let's use the same infrastructure we have for that for cluster management. But from a product perspective, let's not move any of the higher level of the stack onto our existing systems, because if we do that, we may slow them down. We may need them to spend six, 12, 18 months doing a data migration that at the end of the day doesn't actually provide product value. So we, we really like the, the agility that we, that we get from this perspective, where they can find and use off the shelf technology inside of AWS to really accelerate the paper growth. Next topic will be global expansion. So 600 million users, they're not all in the United States, they're not all in Silicon Valley. We actually need to provide a global footprint. And so our footprint today looks like this. Blue are Dropbox data centers, and I think this is pink or orange, is our, our AWS facilities. And we leverage both. All of them are required to actually power the product. If any one of them doesn't work, we have a problem. So this is not a disjoint set of, uh, of, of data or of processing as hopefully the previous set of data processing slides showed. This is actually a fully hybrid model where we're not doing a transition or we're not, we're, our end state is this. Our end state is to provide a system that is going to take advantage of both AWS and the economies of scale we have in certain areas. And so one problem that we run into is going to be around global expansion for storage. How many people here have, know of GDPR? Or know of, okay, it's probably almost every. So GDPR is a big problem, right, for, for us, based on what I've told you before already around where our data is stored. We had to solve that problem. Now, we could build a data center in Europe. The lead time on that is minimum of six months. I'm guessing it's even longer, um, given there's gonna be a lot of other import regulations. There's gonna be a lot of other issues that come with building a data center in Europe for us. Also, the scale at which we need to build that to take scale the other direction doesn't make sense. In order to get economies of scale, you have to have a large enough scale to make for, to go build it yourself. And we know that from a GDPR perspective, we're not gonna have that. And so how can we leverage AWS to actually provide a serving, serving in that market that continues to unlock the customer base without us having to go build this? And so this is where the system called Trampoline comes into play. Trampoline is a way of us storing data in S3 in a region that's not part of the Dropbox core serving regions. And so we provide that abstraction layer so that even a developer at Dropbox doesn't know where that data is stored. It's an abstraction at the user entity. If it's a user that requires GDPR, it's automatically stored in the right place for the user. And if I'm a Dropbox ML developer or a Dropbox AI developer and I wanna do some sophisticated machine learning on it, 
You don't have to worry about querying S3 or versus querying, querying um, our magic pocket system. It just, the system knows which, which bucket to pull it from. When I say bucket, which, which storage location to pull it from automatically. All of this is abstracted from the development team. And so this is an example of how we're able to take advantage of AWS for GDPR. We had a similar story in APJ this past year where in Asia and Australia, we really wanted to provide data locality. There's a real big need for Japan to actually have data locality, and there's a very big need from Australia to have data locality. Australia typically follows some of the GDPR concepts. And so we knew that, and we also knew that we had to provide a solution for that. And so what we did is we said, let's do the same thing. Let's use, let's use S3. Let's use the Tokyo region. Let's use the Australia regions. And we'll actually just re-leverage the same technology we built for GDPR, and we're able to take advantage of that again. Again, this agility concept is back. We're able to provide a global expansion very quickly. I think this was done on the order of three to four, maybe, maybe six months max, but we were able to get all of this out the door, full product launch, not just the infrastructure being built, full product launch within six months. There's a huge value for us for having this agility that AWS provides globally. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Anuj now. I'm just gonna close out with some stuff on hybrid, but thank you all for this. Hopefully this is some insights into the Dropbox Cloud journey. Um, there's a lot here. We'll take some questions afterwards, I think. So thank you very much. All right, so Hybrid Cloud with AWS has unleashed agility, skill, and innovation for Dropbox, and it can do the same for you. I just want to thank you all for coming to this session. And please don't forget to fill out the survey. We take our CSATs very seriously here. All right, and we'll be taking questions off stage. So thanks a lot for coming.